Today, I want to talk to you about another king in the Old Testament. I want to talk to you about Asa. Success is measured differently by the world standards. Secular culture often measures success by positions, by platforms, and by possessions. God evaluates success much differently. I've taught you guys this for a long time. Success in God's eyes, number one, is knowing God. Number two, becoming what God's called you to be. Number two, three, doing what God's called you to do. Why is this important? In a sense, Asa was successful. In a sense, he had a relationship with God. He knew God. He pressed into being what God called him to be. But there was something in his character that held him back a little bit. I want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk to you about defeating the enemy of compromise. Maybe you can relate to Asa. Whenever you try to move forward, there's this little compromise that comes up in your life. Maybe it's anger. Man, I don't know what happens. I feel like I don't get my way. I, you know, I just kind of like, I still get upset. I want to still pick the game up, the Monopoly game. I still want to turn it over. Maybe it's that little addiction. I mean, you love God. You go to church. I mean, you're a giver. You even share your faith. And yet, and yet, there's this, this, this little aspect to your personality. There's this little anger. There's this little addiction. And oftentimes, people actually don't see it. Until they get up close. Asa loved God. He was a king that knew God. And he sought to expand the kingdom. And yet there was something in his life. There was this little compromise. I think back in my life. I think about how many times if I asked the Lord. Lord work on my mouth. Help me self control God. And, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. All of our locations. But how many of y'all would be honest enough to say. That you've said the wrong thing at the wrong time. I'm like, God, why have I done that again? And it impacts people. Asa loved God. When you see in the Bible about Asa's life, and yet there was, there was something on the, watch this, something that he struggled with. It was a compromise. How do you defeat compromise, pastor? At times, Asa struggled to do the right thing, God's way. <clears throat> he compromised. By the way, it cost him. Compromise costs you. It costs you. It costs your family. Ultimately for Asa, it cost the nation. In a variety of reasons, people compromise. Sometimes because we want to please man before pleasing God. Sometimes is that we don't want to be honest with the thing that we're struggling with. Well, I don't want people to find out about it. By the way, most people really do know a lot more than we realize. Particularly if there's external things that we're struggling with. Maybe sometimes we're compromising and, and we don't want people to know about it because we're just flat out embarrassed. It's like, well, if they know that I'm dealing with this, then they're not going to like me, they're not going to love me, and they may reject me. Compromise. There are times when we just don't know the right thing to do. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe you feel like, Pastor, if I knew what to do, if I knew how to get out of this situation, I would do it. Or you do know, but maybe you're just apathetic about it. Sometimes we just don't care enough to engage. It reminds me of little Johnny and his irritated teacher. She tried and tried to get Johnny to engage in class and read his textbooks and do his assignments, but he never read his books. The guy never did. He never did his assignments, and the only time he spoke in class was to disrupt it with nonsense. Finally, the teacher just boiled over with frustration and lashed out, Johnny, why do you insist on being ignorant and apathetic? The teacher continued, do you even know what those words mean? Johnny replied snidely, I don't know and I don't care. Sometimes we deal with things because we're not aware of how to get out of it. I mean, could you imagine if somebody said every single bondage in your life, every single little thing you deal with, what if you knew how to deal with it and you had the passion to move through it? That anger, that attitude, that depressing thought that brings you down into the valley and you're like, you know what, I know what to do. Sometimes we simply don't know what to do. I wanna to talk to you about that today. 
I thank God, by the way, I thank God that God has left us men and women in the Bible that struggled with like passion. They struggled with things like us and they've given us a pathway out. Today I want to talk to you about defeating, defeating that enemy of compromise. Back to King Asa, he was the great, this is really interesting, the great, great grandson of King David and the great grandson of King Solomon. So he had wonderful heritage in that sense. And yet his grandfather and his father didn't walk with the Lord. So his great grandfather did and his great great grandfather did, but his grandfather and his dad did not. So he had good heritage, but not immediate models in his home. So he picked up some things. By the way, I want to say this to grandparents and great-grandparents. Don't ever underestimate the influence you have on your grandchildren. Matter of fact, sometimes when a parent is not there, it's the grandparent that steps in. I think of Pastor Tom Mullins, Coach Tom, we call him, the pastor of Christ Fellowship for many, many years, who's been a mentor to me. His dad was not around, but it was his grandfather that was a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor to influence your kids. So I want to say to all the grandmothers, all the grandfathers, all the great-grandfathers, great-grandmothers, don't ever underestimate the power of spiritual influence that you have in your grandchildren. Aza's forefathers, his dad, and his immediate grandfather encouraged the worship of false gods in the temple of Jerusalem as well has built pagan shrines and altars called high places. This is important throughout the nation. The high places were hills and mountains where the people of God blended the worship of the true God with the worship of false gods. Why would they do that? Why would they compromise like that? They would go up to these high places. Literally, they called them high places. Why? Because they geographically, they were built up on these little hills. And they would mix two things. One, they would often mix the worship of Yahweh and one of the main false gods that were worshipped was Baal. Pastor, why would they worship Baal? They worshipped Yahweh because they didn't want to offend the God who protected the nation. At the same time, they worshipped the false god of Baal. Why? Because they thought that Baal would give them something. They felt that Yahweh would protect them, but Baal would provide for them. So they mixed the two worship. We need protection and we need provision. So they would go up to the high places. There were other gods that were worshipped there besides Yahweh. There There was so much idolatry in this worship, so much. So in the temple, there was idol worship. It wasn't being used to worship God like it was during the time of Solomon. It, was, it had gone corrupt. The, 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 lamp of, the, the, the light of God had gone out in the temple in Jerusalem. And now you had all of these, literally, all of these idolatrous high places of worship throughout the nation. And herein comes Asa. By the way, idolatry, a lot of times people ask, you know, what is idolatry? I, I can give you a simple definition. Idolatry is anything that you put before God in your life. That's it. Sometimes it's bad things. By the way, sometimes it's good things. Anytime God, anytime God doesn't take first place in your life, it's idolatry. Well, here it's clearly they had mixed, mixed the pure and the profane. It doesn't take much to contaminate. When you think about worship, you think about when they would go up there, one moment worshiping Yahweh, next minute Baal, the contamination of that. I think of, I think how much, by the way, how much, think about this, how much poison does it really take to, to like poison a jar of water? How, mu- how much Sinai does it take to be dropped? In other words, it doesn't take a lot of idolatry and worshiping the profane to impact the pure. In our hearts, in a church, in our families, That's why pure worship. Jesus said, I'm looking for those that worship me in spirit and in truth. Don't bring in idolatry. Don't mix the profane with the pure. Think about it. (laughs) I was thinking about purity, and I was thinking about the pure and the profane. You know, when I go, it's a little funny. When I go grocery shopping, my wife and my, my little daughter, she's 14, and she has an app, and she evaluates what we eat, what we can buy at the store. I don't want to tell you the app. 
But she evaluates. And so I remember one time I went by the bread section. I was like, I'm getting me some bunny bread. Come on, somebody. And she's like, that's terrible. It doesn't fit the, you know, this app. And I'm like, I turned out pretty good. How many of y'all grew up eating bunny bread? Come on. You know what I mean? Good stuff. What was that app about? That app is about identifying what is good and what is bad to eat. Matter of fact, do we ever do that in our spiritual life? Is this good to eat? Is this good food? Are we putting bad things on the inside of us? So why do we allow ourselves to open doors to compromise? Compromise starts with a feeling that just a little issue on the side, just this little thing on the side, but eventually it grows up and it impacts your whole life, it impacts your family, it impacts your relationships. It grows much bigger than we realize. King Asa was a righteous king, listen, for the most part. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 11. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. Remember, David really was Asa's great, great grandfather. Not his father, not his grandfather. It was really his great, great grandfather. Think about that. The reality is, is that his father, Abijah, was a wicked king. Abijah was a guy that did not love God. Matter of fact, he built and he allowed pagan worship in the house of God. So Asa comes into power, and the first thing he does is he cleans out the idols out of the temple. We got to rid our land of this stuff. We got to restore worship back in Israel. But he didn't go far enough. How many times you meet somebody, they're saved, they love God. I mean, they're going to heaven, right? Their name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, but. But, but, they, but, they, but they don't go far enough. They allow that, 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 that addiction. They allow that secret sin. They allow that thing to just kind of, and they think, man, that's all right. You know, nobody really knows about it. Well, guess what? God does, and your soul does. So what do you mean, pastor? I mean, he cleaned out the temple. The Bible says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But 1 Kings 15, 14 says, but the high places were not removed. So he cleaned out the temple in Jerusalem of the idols but he allowed the idols to stay at the high places. Why would Asa allow the high places to stay? I'll tell you why. Because primarily 90% of the farmers, the the country folk, the people that would grow the agriculture for the land, they, they, they really wanted Baal. They really wanted the blessing of Baal, even though he was a false god. And, and so what Asa did is he compromised. He didn't want to offend the farmers. It was too much work. Sometimes we allow things because it's just too much work. It's just too much energy. So he allows false worship to take place and continue. The fact is, is that he was unwilling. He was unwilling to deal with the impure. He, he allowed it. He, he caved into pressure. How many times in our lives are you waiting with the wrong group? Well, you know, I'm with these friends and everybody's doing it. Wait, time out. Don't cave in. Don't allow somebody else, don't give somebody that much power in your life that they allow, that they somehow make you do things that you know that are hurtful to you. He caved in, he caved into the pressure. He he propagated this compromise. He gave up too much and gave away. It was an unholy compromise. Asa lived in an extremely divided nation. When his grandfather Rehoboam was king, the nation of Israel divided into two parts, the northern and the southern. You guys know that. The southern was Judah. The northern was called Israel. It was a divided family. Lots of challenges there. By the way, all of the Jewish people were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now, and now they've divided. You got the northern kingdom and you got the southern kingdom. It's on this backdrop that Asa compromises again. Number one, how did he compromise? He compromised because he was unwilling to take out and clean up the high places of worship. He allowed a mixture of the pure and the profane. He caved into pressure. He didn't want to offend the farmers. They thought they needed the blessing of Baal. It's a false god. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 16 says, Now there was war between Asa and And Basham, king of Israel, in their days, and Basham, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah. And there he, watch this, that he might let more go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Basha annexed part of the territory of Judah and built a military base there. So he can control the flow of goods and people in and out. Watch this. This area is the same area where the farmers and the shepherds lived. I want you to hear me. The areas 
that Asa allowed to have all the high places. He cut a deal with these people and said, okay, I'm not gonna mess with your idolatry is the exact places that the king of Israel came in and took over. Pastor, what's your point? What you and I compromise to keep, ultimately, we'll lose in the end. What we think that we're compromising to keep in life, that was the exact area that the enemy took back. We think we're appeasing someone, we're appeasing a situation, wrong group, wrong place, wrong time, doing the wrong stuff. Maybe just a lack of passion for God. Maybe just apathy in our hearts. All these different things seek to steal the passion out of our heart for God. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 18. It gets worse for Asa. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that was left in the treasury of the house of the Lord and the treasury of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of the servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadon, the son of uh, Tem. I can't even pronounce it. The son of Hezrion and the king of Syria who dwelt in Damascus saying, let there be a treaty. He's now cutting a treaty with the king of Syria between you and me as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. Come and break your treaty with Basham, king of Israel so that he will withdraw from me. He now tries to cut a deal with a foreign king to try to get some relief from the king of Israel. What am I saying? Number one, he wouldn't deal with the high places compromise. Number two, now he's cutting deals with foreign kings because he wouldn't address the issues in the nation. Think about this. How many times in our lives do we find ourselves, how did I get here? What happened? This is not just a leadership message. This is a message for everybody. It's a message when, when God is calling us to come up. Everybody say, come up. To come up in our leadership, to come up as men of God, ladies, to come up as women of God, to, to, to be who God's called us to be. Asa was a man. Yes, he followed the Lord, but he compromised a little, and it cost him. It cost him. Let me give you a couple things about Asa's life that are positive, and then I'm going to give you one thing in the end. What, what, is my, what is my point here? Man, I'm trying to help you out. I, I want us to ruthlessly deal with the areas in our lives that are holding us back from becoming what God called us to be. That's spiritual success. From doing, remember what success, knowing God, becoming and doing. Becoming what? Becoming who God called you to be, doing what God called you to do. We, we've got to see compromise differently. It's not just some little thing. We've got, to, we've got to say, no, no. This is seeking to sabotage my success. Here's what he did right. Asa had a fervor for God. Asa was a man of commitment and character. This is very sobering. I think there's people that go to church. There's people that show up. There could be small group leaders, dream team leaders. They, they do a lot of things right, but, they, but they're unwilling to deal with that. What is that? Your that may be different than my that, or that may be different than that. But, but there's, there, there's there, that. That attitude, that little thing. Maybe that's that late night thing you do. Whatever it is that you think soothes you, but it actually enslaves you. Number one, Asa had a fervor for God. Asa was a man of commitment and character. He had a passion and a fervor. It began with commitment. Watch this. Second Chronicles 15, 17. Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He was passionate, godly. The word committed here is a powerful word. It is the word, watch this, the Hebrew word shalam. You ever heard of shalom? Peace. Shalam, it means a heart, watch this, that is safe and peaceful in God. Fervor is similar to passion. Having fervor or passion for God and making a difference, it begins with commitment. Pastor, I want to be passionate for God. Well, it's like forgiveness. How do you get forgiveness? Well, how do you extend forgiveness? I'll forgive as soon as I feel like forgiving. No, no, that's not how it works. You make a decision. Everyone say decision. You make a commitment and a decision, and the feelings of forgiveness follow. It's the same way passion for God. Passion just, just doesn't come. You make a commitment to press into God, and when you do, passion starts growing. But what I loved about Aza here is that he was pressing in. He, his heart was committed to the Lord. By the way, passion comes and passion goes. That's why we got to put logs on the fire. A lot of times people are waiting for God to light the fire, and God's saying, I'm waiting for you to commit. If you'll commit, I'll light the fire. We don't light the fire, but we got to make a commitment. we got to be all in. The interesting thing, Asa wasn't raised to wholeheartedly follow the Lord. 
He was raised to honor all the gods. His grandparents and his parents encouraged many idols in Asa's life. Again, what is an idol? Idols are anything we put before God. 1 Kings 16, or 15, 12. He got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. Where? In Jerusalem. Asa recognized that for him to follow God with fervor, he had to get rid of the idols in the temple. By the way, if, if we're being controlled by idols, whether it's sinful habits or sinful desires, by the way, God has not designed anything to control you. He's designed you to be led by the Holy Spirit, not to be controlled by your comp- compulsion, not to be controlled by an appetite. He, he's designed us to be led by the Spirit. Now, the fervor of God was fan into flame in Asa when he reinstated worship. Pastor, how do I get the flame of God? I want to say this to all of our locations. The number one way, by the way, the number one way as you make a commitment to press into God, that fire starts burning again. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe you feel like you've allowed that fire to wane. Asa saw the temple had been corrupted, and guess what he did? One of the first things he did, cleaned out the temple and reinstituted worship. Church. Pastor, I want to be on fire for God. Hang out with Christian people. Go to church. I'm waiting for a deep revelation. That's pretty deep. You, you kind of get the spirit on you of where the people that you hang out with. Well, I don't know what's going on, man. I just don't feel like I've got the fire anymore. Have you put any logs on the fire? One of the greatest ways to put a log on the fire is show up in the house of God. When you show up in the house of God, how do I know that? That's what Asa did. See, here's the problem. We don't just clean the temple out. We got to fill it up with good stuff. A lot of times we clean it out. I'm repenting of my sin. Well, then fill up your life with the pure, the positive, the powerful. Second, Second Chronicles 15, it's what he did. It's how he stayed on fire for the Lord. Second Chronicles 15, 10 and 11. They, they, they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats. Asa's father polluted the temple Asa reinstituted worship in the temple. Pastor, where does the fire burn in your heart? How how does it grow? Get around Christian people in the house of God. Be in the worship, be in corporate worship. Hear the teaching of the word. Be in the body of Christ. Be in the house of God. Just get here. By the way, when you're going through struggles, don't run from God in God's house. Run to God in God's house. Asa had a passion for God and he showed up in the house of God. Number two, Asa experienced favor from God. Favor is God's blessing and grace. We don't earn grace. Uh, We don't earn favor. That's not how it works. We receive it and we walk in it though. I've had a lot of people say, well, you know, it's grace. Well, we don't do anything. No, no, you do have to walk in it. (laughs) Grace empowers you to overcome sin. Grace is God doing for you what you can't do for yourself. And the Bible says that there was great favor and grace. There was favor upon his life. what What does favor do? Well, What does it practically look like to have God's favor in your life? For instance, when the devil stirs up something against your life and he comes against your life, God gives you, watch this, protection and victory. That's called favor. That's called favor. Just as he did for Asa. The devil stirred up an enemy, the neighboring Cushites against Asa and the people, but Asa lived in God's favor. Everybody say favor. God's favor. God's favor, God's blessing. The Cushites sent a vast army to attack, and God was with Asa. Look at 2 Chronicles 14, 12. And the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah, and the Cushites fled. Who struck them down? Who struck the enemy down? The Lord did. Pastor, I just want God, I, I just want God's help. That's called favor. God wants to help you. God, by the way, God wants to step in and fight your enemies for you and minimally with you. God wants to do that. Well, I just thought that Christianity is about Jesus saving my soul. That's the start. That's 101, the most important. Don't skip that class. But then there's the blessing of God. There's the favor of God. God's favor preserves. God's favor protects your life, your family. By the way, your nation, if you allow him to. Well, I just want to do it my own way. Any nation that pushes God's, God out, guess what? Things don't bode well for them for the future. Psalms chapter five, verse 12. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround them with a shield. Pastor, what are you saying? Asa, watch this. He had a fervor for God, but he had favor with God. Favor was upon his life. And by the way, because of that, the whole nation. 
It only takes one person to get right with God in a family and God's blessing can come on that family. I've had ladies in our church that I've been their pastor, their husbands don't serve God. Ma'am, if you'll serve God, God's blessing will still come on your whole family and vice versa. Matter of fact, I've had teenagers, one kid gets saved and I mean, all of a sudden it brings favor into that family. Favor is the blessing of God. It's the protection of God. It's God fighting your battles. It's God's defending you. Asa had a fervor for God and and Asa experienced favor from God. There's peace of God, the power of God. Second Chronicles 15, 15. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath for they had sworn with their heart and sought him and all their soul and it was found by him. And the Lord gave them rest. By the way, The favor of God was upon Asa and upon the nation. And God said, you know what? There's going to be a season of reprieve and rest. Wouldn't you guys like a season of reprieve and rest? Pastor, I just feel like I'm I'm just always in a battle. I'm always fighting. I'm not suggesting that we can be exempt from trials and tribulation. I am saying that God can fill you with power in the midst of it. And there can be rest on every side. That's favor. That's God doing for you what you can't do for yourself. Christianity is not... It's not about you pulling yourself up by your bootstrap. It's you allowing God to, watch this, bless you, protect you, save you, and help you. It's the favor of God. Asa Asa had a passion for God, a fervor for God, and he had favor. He had favor from God. With Asa, we see favor and fervor. We see him walk in that. However, However, there was a fracture in his soul. There was a fracture. The blessing of God. You guys have seen this before. Somebody's life, they're hungry for God, they show up, and yet yet there's this this one aspect they don't realize. They're they're unwilling to deal with it. Fervor for God. Favor from God. But Asa had a fracture with God, the last point. Compromise caused a fracture in his relationship with God and ultimately his calling. I think back of the people that I know. I think back of the shipwrecks. I think of the, the lives that have been, um, man, they've just been taken out. didn't have to happen that way. You can end well. You can be strong in God. I'm talking to every single person at every single location. And by the way, the enemy sometimes will let you get set up and things will be going well in your life, your job, with your kids, even in your family. But, 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 but there's, this, there's this one area. I'm trying to give you courage to deal with that. One area. Cost him. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 17. Compromise caused a fracture in Aza's relationship. Although he did not remove... He did not remove the high places from Israel. Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all of his life. His heart was, he was a a good man. He loved God. He loved God. But his heart, he allowed something in his life. He was a good man. He he loved God. He, He went to church. He was a small group leader. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was, he was, he was on the worship team. He was, a, he was a good man. He gave to God. He was a church person. But he was unwilling to remove this one thing. What is that one thing? That's the sabotage. The pastor, well, it's not that big of a deal. I think Church of the King, you guys make things, small deals, big deals. No, I'm trying to help you not get sabotaged in your walk with God. I'm trying to help you. I don't know how more transparent I can be about my life. I don't know what else I can do. I don't know how I can preach. I'm trying to help you to, let me tell you something, to, to cross the finish line on fire for God and not be shipwrecked. That's what I'm trying. You guys have all seen that. You get saved with somebody, you're on fire for God, and you're in small group together, you're growing in God, and five or ten years later, where are they? What happened to them? Where are they? Could it be? Could it be that they were unwilling? They were unwilling to deal with that, that enemy of compromise? Ah, they thought you were kind of legalistic thinking about it. 
Nah, you're a legalist. And you kept saying, man, I, I, just, I, just, I just think it's not good for you, man. And, 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 and yet, and yet, and yet, the more that you appealed to them, the more they hardened themselves in that position. Asa was a good man. He went to church, but he was unwilling, although he did not remove the high places from Israel. He, wouldn't, he, didn't, he, he, he compromised in that. Listen to this. He purified the temple. Amazing. He cleaned up idol worship in the city of Jerusalem. Astounding. However, he didn't take down the high places around the nation. Sadly. Asa was probably, he would probably be considered, man, a really solid person. May have been volunteered in his church. He was good at a lot. And there was a day his friend said, man, you should really deal with this. Nah, this one area. Well, Pastor, what's the big deal? Well, one of the things I found is what you don't deal with and what you're unwilling to deal with, you actually transition it and transmit it to the next generation. The compromise in our lives play out in the lives of our kids and the next generation. Asa didn't take down the high places. And he handed the problem down to his son, Jehoshaphat. Look at what happened. Second Chronicles, last scriptures. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 32 to 33. He followed the ways of his father. Talking about Jehoshaphat. That's his son. He followed the ways of his father, Asa, and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Listen, he's following God just like his daddy. The high places, however, were not removed. The result? And the people still had not set their hearts on God, the God of their ancestors. Wow. Jehoshaphat was a good man. He went to church like his dad, but just like his dad. The same compromise he struggled with, he transmitted it to his son. Same one. That's why it's so important for us to deal with our stuff now. To break it now. To not transmit it. I wrote this down. What Aza didn't face now became his son's problem. What we don't face transfers to the next generation. What is not transformed is transmitted. What you don't deal with, the next generation will have to face. Often, what we don't face only festers and becomes a bigger monster for the next generation to battle. Remember, what one generation tolerates, the next generation propagates. Man, I'm not trying to be a heavy. I'm preaching to myself right now. Only Jesus is perfect. I get that. Man, I look at my life at a message like this. I said, is there an attitude? Is there something that my son's picking up? My daughter's picking up? My two daughters, my two sons. And yes, they have a will, and they have to make a decision to follow Christ themselves. I don't want to put any heavy on anybody, no condemnation. But I will say this. In my life, I want to make sure it's hard enough to follow God in this world because of our, our culture. It's, can I tell you something? I don't want to communicate and transmit heavy burdens on them and battles that they have to face because I was unwilling to address it. He said the same thing he did. You guys ever hear this? The kid that gets mad at the alcoholic dad because he didn't treat him right. And he makes this comment, I hate you. I don't want to be like you. I'm never going to do with you. I'm never going to be. And the same thing gets on that kid. Wow. We got to break it. We gotta break it. Break what? Break whatever it is. Maybe it's that secret nighttime addiction. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just an attitude. I know I've had some. I know I've communicated some stuff to my kids at times that, you know what? I'm asking for God's grace, God's forgiveness, and going back and repenting. Why? Because I wanna break. I don't wanna communicate a bad attitude that my kids and my daughter, my sons pick up. In other words, we gotta deal with it. Aza had a chance. Clear out the high places because he didn't. Because he didn't. The Bible said Jehoshaphat, he was a good man and he loved God, but, but he didn't deal with it. 
and the whole nation never set their heart on God. You saw how it got bigger? Yeah. I'm gonna pray for everybody. I, and I, and I, I just wanna pray. I, I believe in God. Let me tell you, I've made mistakes. I mis- I've made mistakes as a parent. I talk about them all the time. But where I am in my life, I wanna make sure is there anything in my life that I need to deal with because I don't want to transmit them to you. I don't want to transmit them to the people around me. Let's deal with the compromise so we don't, watch this, transmit it to the next. Yeah, God wants to help you. God wants to deliver you. God is for you. He's not against you. And the first step is trusting Christ as your Savior. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads. If we can pray right now, I just want to pray. I want to come before the Lord and I believe God's presence is here. God loves you. God's not mad at you. He cares so deeply about you. And maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Matter of fact, as you trust Christ, this is breaking generational things off your family. You may be the first Christian, the first person that's born again in your family. Man, wouldn't that be powerful? And you set up a whole godly legacy. Maybe you're the one to do that. If you don't know Christ, if you're not sure about your relationship with God, I want to pray for you. Just a moment, the count of three, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, to cleanse me, and to make me new. What do you have to believe? Number one, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Number two, we've got to believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Number three, we personally have to confess him. I can confess with you, but I can't confess for you. I can come alongside of you, but you've got to pray the prayer. So are you right with God? You know that you know if you die today, you're ready to stand before God. At the count of three, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Pastor, pray for me. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, to cleanse me, and to make me new. If that's you, at the count of three, just lift your hand up high. One, two, three. Quickly, I'm going to ask everybody to raise their hands. It needs Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Church, can we pray with those that are trusting Christ, those that are literally watching online, all of our locations. Let's just pray together right now. Can we just, all of us lift our voice, say, dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. Say this last thing. Say, Jesus, I take my life and I put in your hands. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. Wow, what an incredible message. And I really hope that you're walking away encouraged and full of hope that God is with you and God loves you. And I do wanna take a second to talk to those of you who may be making a decision right now to commit your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time, or maybe to recommit your life to Christ. If that is you, we are so excited for you. And as a church, we would love nothing more than to just walk alongside you, to show you what it means to follow Jesus. Because we believe that you're leaving the past in the past, and this is not the finish line, it's actually the starting line of an amazing life of following Jesus for the rest of your life. So would you give us the privilege of just following up with you, you some resources and helping you as you're beginning to walk out this new life of following Jesus. And again, congratulations. We're so excited for you. And if you do want to be a part of just partnering with us to continue to reach people and build lives, you can always go online to churchoftheking.com slash give to be a part of seeing the gospel go forth and people to hear about Jesus. And lastly, I want to encourage you, if you're not already, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to follow us on Facebook, to really stay up to date with all that God has for us, all the content that we're putting out. Pastor Steve has some powerful messages every single week for us, and we're really growing and learning what it means. to to live out the life that God has for us. I encourage you to follow along, to be a part of all that God is doing here at Church of the King. And again, we just want to say thank you for being a part of our service today. We love you guys. We hope you have an awesome rest of the week, and we'll see you very soon.